make sure there are, um, Dorothy's was kind enough to donate breakfast tacos, so help yourself if you haven't already. And we welcome you this morning, glad you're here. Um, in Dripping Springs ISD, communicating with our stakeholders is very important to us. And we do that in many ways, from the district level, from the campus level, and from the classroom level. So today's event, along with the reports that are sitting at the door, you're welcome to um, take on your way out, or if you don't already have them, are two of the ways we do that at the district level. There's also an insert in that report that gives an overview of all the tools that we use. So I wanted to point that out to you, and again, thank you for being here um, as we share a lot of information, and questions can be asked during the presentation or afterwards if you prefer to do that. I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Bruce Gearing, our superintendent. He's um, been in Dripping Springs ISD for seven years, has introduced an environment and a culture of transformation in order to more effectively <coughs> serve our students in, the, in their futures that they face and help them reach their potential. He shared his vision not only internally with our staff and students, but also has presented at many statewide conferences and workshops. He was a finalist for the 2016 Superintendent of the Year Award from the Texas Association of School Boards. Dr. Gearing serves in many roles every day as a bridge builder, a visionary leader, a dedicated educator, and I'm sure most importantly to some people at least a husband and a father. So we're happy to have him and he's going to start us off. Thank you, Dale. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's uh, pretty early, so. I uh, apologize if I'm not 100% here this morning, so thank you so much for coming today. We really appreciate you taking the time to come and listen to what we have to share with you. We're here to really celebrate the really, truly outstanding things that are happening in Dripping Springs ISD. Uh, we're very proud of who we are and what our kids accomplish. And our kids can only accomplish those things because we have incredible adults who give 115% every single day to make sure that our kids have everything that they need. So we're gonna jump right in. I would like to recognize Shannon O'Connor is here this morning from the school board. And I don't see any other school board members. Oh, do I get extra please? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'd like to introduce our administrators to you who are with us today. So we have Assistant Superintendent for Finance, uh, Elaine Cogburn, Assistant Superintendent for Learning and Innovation, Dr. Nicole Painish, Executive Director for Communications, Daryl Whitaker, Executive Director for <laughs> Human Resources with impeccable timing, Tiffany Duncan. <laughs> and we have the Director of Technology, who makes sure that we stay up and running every single day, uh, Cindy Wade, Director of Events and Safety and Emergency Management, Kurt Marrick. I miss somebody. Oh. And uh, our communication specialist, Mr. Alan Bregman, who's intimidating me right now. <laughs> so welcome, thank you. I'd also like to recognize we have Jack Dameron here from the Texas Association of School Boards. So welcome, Jack. Jack is a grandparent in our district, and uh, we see Jack a lot around the, the district. We also have Jennifer Splitter here from Apple, and I'm afraid you'll have to help me. Me? Yes. I thought you might be with Jennifer this evening. All right, so we always have to start by going back to why we're here. And we're really here because we're preparing our kids for their future. And we have to make sure in our mind that we accomplish two things with them before they walk out our doors. We have to inspire and equip them to be lifelong learners and positive contributors to the world. And if we can accomplish those two things, then I think we send them out to the world with a, an opportunity to be successful. And we can only do that if we're doing that in partnership with them, with their parents, and with this community at large, and of course with the faculty that we work with on a daily basis. And so we work extremely hard every day to make sure that we point ourselves back to these statements. These statements have been in the district, tweaked very slightly and wordsmith very slightly since before 2000, um, since several superintendents ago and several school boards ago. And the one thing we do know is that change is inevitable, but the, the kinds of core values and beliefs that we have is what drives the district forward. And that's the most important thing to us. So we'd like to recognize Dr. Mary Jane Hedrick, school board member. 
So we'd like to share a little bit with you about the culture of the district and who we are. Um, and so we have a short video presentation. Our job is to make sure that the culture that we have in the district around learning reflects what our students need for their future. Culture for me is what we do on a daily basis. It, it's our norms, it's our values, it's our core beliefs, it's the things that drive the decisions that I make, every little decision that I make. For too long I think our culture in public education has been to do things to people, to do learning to kids, to make sure that they are taught and that they do things a certain way and that they achieve a certain result. If I'm given a script and I'm a compliant kind of a person, I can follow that script. I can take a recipe and produce a carrot cake. But a chef can take a set of ingredients and produce something completely new and creative. Um, and that's the difference I see, is that culture is about creating something new that you didn't expect, that goes far beyond what your goal was. We start off with these four words of organic, empowerment, performance and learning and then we have a lot of conversation around what do each of those mean and how do they affect what we do on a daily basis. Organic to me is creating an environment where learning can flourish and happen. An organic learning environment allows our students to develop naturally. We let our students have the freedom to develop their skills and interests. Empowerment means really allowing teachers to develop that organic environment for themselves and for their students. Our students are empowered because they're engaged in their learning. I believe I have ownership over my own education. We have to empower individuals at every level of the organization, including students, to create that environment that will foster their learning over time. And then how do we know that that learning is really happening? Well, I believe that happens through performance. It's about learning consistently over time, new things all the time, but then also demonstrating that learning in some way that positively impacts the world. Our students showcase their abilities in their performance. Performance is where I get to show what I've learned. We talk about personalized learning. Um, I like to even go further and say it's more personal learning because I have to have ownership of it. I really have to take agency over my learning to make sure that I achieve the goals that I've set for myself uh, and that I truly understand how to get there. Learning happens anytime, anywhere, anyhow. I get to learn about what I love. We do things organically. We do empower people at every level in the organization. Um, we do expect high levels of performance out of every individual in our organization. Um, and we're a learning organization. That means every individual is a learner and um, the organization as a whole is a, is a learning organization. Dale and Alan for putting that together. They did a great job of uh, making me look better than I am. So that's <laughs> awesome. Um, quick facts about the district, very really quick. 198 square miles. So we have a fairly large area that we cover. Seven campuses right now. Almost 500 acres that we uh, look after and groom and take care of. Over a million square feet of facilities. Almost 7,000 students now and growing every single day. Our last five years, we've grown more than 30% in student population. Um, we'll hear more about our staff in a little bit, and a little bit more about the details of that $66 million budget. Um, we have seven restaurants in the district. We serve over 3,000 meals every single day. And we run 40 buses on 153 routes, about 4,000 miles, about 2,000 kids a day. 
And importantly, we run about 1,300 extracurricular trips on top of that every single day. I mean, every single year, not every single day. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in the third year now of our five-year strategic plan. And we put a strategic plan in place because it's really important that we set goals and that we make sure that we're tracking progress towards those goals to make sure that we're on track. But really, this is a very fluid process and one that we're constantly revisiting to make sure that we're staying on track. Um, but for us, it's really about four main things. And the first of those is the village. And that's part of the reason that we're here today, because we live in the community, we are part of the community, and it's critically important that both internally and externally we're communicating really well, that we're letting everybody know the great things that are happening, um, that we're communicating when things don't go exactly the right way. And also, more importantly, that we're listening to the community as a whole. That we really are understanding where the community is and what their needs and wants are, and that we're working hard towards making that happen. And just to reiterate again, the whole reason we're in this, of course, is for our kids' future. And so that communication is absolutely critically important to make sure that we connect where our kids are now and where they're going. And so we call this the village, because it truly does take a village to raise a child. And it takes every one of us together to make sure that we have the organic environment that's necessary to make sure that our kids reach their goals. Operations for us is what we call breathing. So these are the things that have to happen on a daily basis to make sure that we're efficient and effective in what we do. And Elaine is in charge of this realm, and for the most part it really does. We don't notice that it happens most of the time. When we figure out that, that it's there is when it's really not there. When something goes wrong, and you start breathing for a minute and you suddenly realize like all these things have been happening that we didn't take notice of, that they have to happen truly effectively and efficiently. Our people are the most critical resource that we have. And our goal, our pledge, is to put a life changer in every position in the district. And people ask me all the time, well, what is a life changer? How do you define that? And I refuse to do it because it depends. It depends on the situation. It depends on the people involved. It depends on on what we're trying to accomplish in that particular realm. But when I say every position in the district, I truly mean that. So we want life-changing teachers in the classroom for sure. But we also want a life-changing bus driver that hits that kid first thing in the morning. We want to make sure that when they come through the lunch line that they're getting a really positive and learning experience. And we want to make sure that our facilities are kept in such a way that our kids and our staff and our faculty have the best possible environment to learn. We believe we have to hire the right people in the first place, and we're working really hard on making sure that we identify who those right people are. But once we have them, we also have to build their capacity. If we can get the adults in the right place and get them connected to their interests and their passions and get them happy, then they'll do a much better job of serving kids. And so that's one of our main goals on a daily basis is to make sure that our adults are taken care of in the system. And of course, our ultimate goal then is personal learning for every child and every adult in the system. And you heard me talk in the video a little bit about that shift that we're having from personalized learning of doing learning to people and to kids to personal learning. Where we're really having a scaffold, agency for learning, responsibility for learning over time to the learner to make sure that as they walk out our out, out doors at the end and, they, and they're graduating, that they truly are able to go forward with this ability to be lifelong learning. The trouble that we have right now is that our kids' future is not clearly defined. It's changing so rapidly that we have to provide them with a set of skills that will allow them to be flexible and adaptable in their future. Most of our kids are not going to have a career like we have careers. They're going to have four or five of those careers. And some of those, at least, they're going to have to create for themselves. And if we don't prepare them with the skill set necessary to do that, then we're certainly going to have to them. And all of this has to come together in some way. We have to have a vision, we have to have a plan, and we have to speak in <coughs> words. We truly have to understand how that is. And then and only then do we become each of us and DSSD. So I'd like to introduce our Board of Trustees to you very briefly. Uh, our Board President, <coughs> Harry Troll, is a lifelong Dripping Springs resident, graduated from Dripping Springs High School. And not in this building, but in the administration building. Now, Barbara Stratt is our longest serving board member, been on the board over 10 years. 
um, and done an exceptional set of service, has served as president several times and is currently our vice president. Uh, Mr. Ron Jones has also been in the district a long time, has graduated two children out of the system um, and has served a lot on the Dripping Springs Education Foundation before his current service on the school board. Uh, Melissa Grialva is a brand new board member. She just joined the board a couple of months ago uh, and is very quickly learning how we do things and, and how things are on the school board. And we're very pleased to have her. Dr. Mary Jane Hedrick is here as in the beginning of her second term. Isn't that right? Um, and uh, we're very fortunate to have a highly educated board who truly understand public education and understand the vision and the mission that this district has to make sure that we prepare our kids for their future. Uh, Shannon O'Connor is here with us today. We're very fortunate to have somebody who helps us really scrutinize the financial side of the district and make sure that we're doing things effectively, efficiently, and appropriately on a daily basis. And Mr. John Thompson, uh, former city planner for the city of Dripping Springs, brings a lot of development um, expertise to the table and that really helps as we're managing our strong growth. These are very dedicated people. They get no thanks for the most part for the service that they give to the kids of this community. They take their job extremely seriously. They spend a lot of time, effort and hours and almost more importantly they spend a lot of anxious moments making really critical decisions for this community. Uh, because we truly know that the decisions we make as a school district affect the direction that the community takes in the future. And so we're very proud of the work that our school board is doing and we thank them for their service. Uh, not just me that thinks that they're doing a fantastic job, uh, but the school board was honored at Region 13 the last two years in a row as an honor board um, for Region 13. Uh, and uh, were placed then into the, the state competition for school boards as well. And then uh, last year they won, were one of the finalists, five finalists in the HEB Excellence in Education Awards <coughs> competition. Um, and they didn't win, but certainly had a good time at the incredible banquet that HEB puts on to celebrate public education uh, across the state of Texas. We're very proud of the work that our school board does. <coughs> All right, so now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what our kids are doing. And we have to be limiting when we share these things with you. So there are a lot of things that you're not going to hear me talk about today. Because if we were to talk about all of the things that our kids are doing, we'd be here for a very long time. So I'm just going to point out some, some really big highlights for this fall. And then we'll talk about a few of the state level accomplishments that we've had, both on the student side and on the faculty side um, in the last year or so. Of course, volleyball undefeated in district right now um, in the regional semi-final in the playoff rounds. Uh, on Friday night, they'll be playing again, doing an exceptional job, district champions, of course. Our tennis team advanced to the regional final in the team tennis competition in UIL for the third year in a row, and were defeated by Alamo Heights for the third year in a row. So apparently we're slow learners when it comes to figuring out how to beat Alamo Heights. So, uh, certainly that's a perennial a competition that we love to have uh, and tennis teams truly dedicated spend a lot of time and effort uh, on the court. Uh, we have qualified for the playoffs in 5A football and we start those rounds on November 9th um, and so we're excited to watch how our boys will perform. It's next it's the 14th. The 14th. Thank you. Don't show up on the 9th. <laughs> Dr. Gearing said that I hear that a lot. Our boys, cross, boys and girls cross country teams both qualified for the state competition again this year. Um, boys ended up ninth and girls ended up 10th and Bobby Hall placed on the podium in sixth place at the state level. Uh, these kids put in a lot of time and effort. They're there at seven every morning. Um, prior in the summer they're training on their own um, and uh, truly uh, incredible to watch these kids. Max Bebeau uh, was named as the Debate Academic All-American through the National Speech and Debate Association, NSDA. Uh, this is a very rigorous standard that he has to achieve both academically and in terms of his debate success. He has to accumulate 750 NSDA points. They get points every time that they debate in competition. 
Um, and it's, it takes literally all four years for them to gather that many NSDA points. And so these kids are competing on very rigorous schedules um, and maintaining high academic standards all the way through at the same time. Our band is, of course, incredible. I still don't understand how year over year they managed to produce a better show this year than they did last year uh, and outdo themselves. Um, if you didn't get to see the show this year, you truly missed out. Uh, incredible performance from all of our kids. These kids, again, are on the parking lot at 7 a.m. in the morning. If you live nearby, you hear them um, echoing strains uh, through the morning air. Uh, they just came back from St. Louis, Missouri, where they competed in the Bands of America competition. They managed to play six overall out of 75 bands from all classes. They won their own class, um, specifically, uh, and won several special awards uh, in, in that trip as well. Leadership is extremely important in the district, and Part of becoming a lifelong learner and a positive contributor is making sure that our students truly understand the importance of being a leader and making those kinds of decisions as they go forward. And so all of our elementary campuses are part of the, the Cubby Corporation's Leader in Me program and have been for several years. And although some of this feels a little canned in places and a little corporate sometimes, it truly does build a foundation for us to work with our kids on the kinds of tools that they need in order to be successful in the world. <coughs> so we work really hard to make sure that we're implementing with integrity um, this leadership program across our elementary schools. Several of our schools are lighthouse schools, which means they've accomplished a certain level of excellence in this program. And we have the distinction of having Dripping Springs Elementary named this year as an academic distinction lighthouse school for the Leader with Me program, um, which means that they have achieved a certain set of academic standards, both in terms of absolute standard, but also in terms of growth of students academically year over year. Uh, and so very proud of the work that our students are doing. We teach leadership from pre-K on. It's part of our scaffolding that we do to make sure that our students are ready for their future. And that pays off in the long run and so we continue to be a very strong academic district. Uh, this year just had one national semi-finalist for the National Merit Program. Um, this is an extremely rigorous program that is based on the PSAT test from the College Board. Starts out with about 1.5 million students across the state and narrows down to, I think, 16,000 semi-finalists at the end and less than 1% of students in the state of Texas. Uh, Texas is a very difficult state to be a national merit finalist in um, because we have so many kids and because the standard is, is so high. It's based on an index score of your PSAT and then several other um, indicators that you have to meet as we go. Uh, below that level of semi-finalist is uh, what's called a commended student in the national merit program. We had 17 students who managed to reach that level of academic performance. The UIL Lone Star Cup is an accumulation of UIL points in all extracurricular activities over the season. And so this includes athletics, fine arts, uh, band, uh, speech and debate, anything that's UIL related that has competition, we gather points towards the UIL Lone Star Cup. Uh, this is a very rigorous competition among um, high schools. It is uh, banded by district conference, so we're in conference 5A. Um, and for most of the year, actually, we were sitting in second place, and then as we got through the final baseball softball seasons, uh, we finished finally in fourth place. But that is the highest finish that we've ever had as a high school and as a district. And I pointed out it's important because we're not just an academic district. We believe that connecting kids to their interests and passions means that they should perform at exceptionally high levels in anything that they want to do. And we want to provide them with those opportunities to do that and this is evidence of that performance, that our kids are performing at exceptionally high levels in everything that they choose to do. Our girls swimming team was state champions last year, um, and also the 400 meter relay, freestyle relay was state champions, um, and they continue to perform exceptionally strongly this year, and we look forward to uh, hopefully seeing the boys uh, give us a strong final performance as they go through the season. Our first ever tennis singles girls state champion, J.C. Goldsmith, won that championship last year. Matthew Hampill is not a big guy in terms of height, 
but I forget what they told me he can live, and it's just unbelievable uh, what he can do. Uh, and state powerlifting champion with incredible performance on state day last year to win that championship. Destination Imagination taps into the creativity of our students. Um, and this actually is not sponsored on the school campus necessarily, but is run by parents. And most of the uh, work that happens in this competition happens outside of school in people's garages. Um, but these groups of kids uh, do incredible things in the performances that they have to make um, in this competition. And this group of kids made it all the way through to the state competition and finally won that state championship in the extreme division destination. C.D. Haas on the left has been competing in the uh, Texas Association of Pupil Transportation Speech Competition her entire high school career. And she's won it three times in a row. And then finally she was the overall state champion in this competition. And Riley Wheaton is very close behind her coming up. Uh, won the 10th grade division um, this last year and is uh, now a junior and headed, I think, in the same direction again. Right, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Painish to tell you a little bit about the academic achievement of this. Um, so what you see here is the standardized kind of ranking system that the state has for measuring school performance in terms of academic achievement. Um, one of the things that we are really mindful of is we don't look to standardized tests or standardized ranking systems for driving how learning happens for us. But we do try to always be mindful to be certain that when we are focusing on that being our end result, that we um, still stay above measure and are performing at high levels. So while it's not a driver for us, we have continued to perform well on um, both the state rating systems and the state assessment. So you can see here that we received an A um, on our state rating this year. Um, ACT and SAT, so essentially kind of what we look at are those trends of being certain that we are performing above average, that we're um, exceeding the expectations and um, the trends of performance for the region and the state, and we do that both on ACT and SAT here by quite a large margin. In terms of advanced placement, so this is um, related to our AP classes, and students who score a three or higher on those exams um, are traditionally awarded than college credit when they progress beyond high school. So we have 132 students who have um, received achievement awards for their scores on those exams. You see we have several students who take them, and of those students who take them, 77% um, score at that level of being eligible for credit beyond performance on the test. Um, so dual enrollment, it kind of mirrors the purpose of AP, but dual enrollment is credit by completion of the course, not just completion of the exams. So we do have an expansive um, offering, and it continues to expand from year to year with our dual enrollment classes with ACC and UT on ramps. Um, and you can see how many students here have left their experience at Irving Springs High School with college credit coming from the dual enrollment program. So 100% of our students do graduate, with 93% going on to college. And that brings us to kind of our portrait of a graduate. And this is where I want to spend a little bit more of the time that I have to talk to you about how we design for learning and what we believe about learning in the district. So really you see those skills. When we talk about being a lifelong learner, that has to be something that you enjoy and that you um, find challenging along the way in the right ways. And so we kind of approach that more with that skill set that it does take to um, be successful beyond test and assessments, to be successful in learning beyond just the school experience. Um, and try to design for that. So I want you to play along with me for a little bit while I, I model for you just some of what we keep in mind when we try to design for learning. So I want you to take just about 30 seconds to think back to your K-12 education. So think back to when you were in school, sitting in a classroom, and I want you to capture that experience in one word. So just think about it, and you can only have one word, but think of one word that would describe for you what your K-12 educational experience was like. So I want you to share that word with somebody next to you.
more recently. When is a time, or it may not have been recently, but just a time when you were super interested in something and kind of delved in it to learn more about it because you're interested in it? So I want you to think of the last time when you learned something new um, because you were interested in it. So think through what that process was like, what learning took place, how did you learn that, and I want you to capture that experience in one word. So now I want you to share that word with the same person that you shared the first one with. meaningful feedback on academic development, how to really focus on um, you know, those cognitive skills that go beyond just content. Um, we do that through our continued work as a team with our school leaders, with our teachers, with our LNI team um, to really capture kind of this profile of a student. What do we need to know about our learners to be able to co-design what learning looks like for them and then how do we engage them in that process. And so there are several opportunities at the high school level that we've begun to expand in terms of incorporating student voice um, some of that scaffolded development of agency you see begins with the student-led conferences at elementary levels and then kind of um, presents itself in 12th grade with the cornerstone projects that students present. And so um, that's kind of the thought process behind any approach that we take in design for learning and how we build our capacities is how do we involve um, students in that process so that they really are connected to, a, to their learning, that it's interesting and that it's challenging in the right way at the right time um, for our learners. Thank you, Dr. Page. So lifelong learners, and you've heard how we do that, but also positive contributors. And so in order to make sure that that happens, one of the things that we push pretty hard in the district is community service. And so I just want to share with you that the class of 2018 put in more than 43,000 hours of community service. And those are just the hours that they reported with us. So we know that our students are also actively involved in a lot more than this. Um, but we think that it's important that they give back to this community and to other communities outside of here uh, as they become positive contributors to the world. And then also the class of 2018 earned over $7 million in scholarships to go away to colleges all over the United States and also some international schools. And so we're very proud of the work that our kids do as they exit out of our system and take that next step. And we want to continue to make sure that we're preparing them for that moment in time and they take that next step. So you heard Dr. Panish talk a little bit about internships and externships and job sharing opportunities. We believe that it's critically important for kids to be connected to what they're interested and passionate about. And sometimes it takes experiences for them to understand what it is they love to do, but also almost as importantly what it is that they really don't want to do. And so we're fortunate that at the high school we have this fall over 100 kids involved in real world placements inside businesses across our community and getting real life experiences about what it is that they think they're interested in. Um, and to give you an example of what this looks like, these are some of the um, companies that are working with our kids in various different ways. Um, you know, L2 Aviation is a great example, a very nondescript little building on 290 that's doing incredible work um, in, in aerospace and, and aviation 
Um, and our kids are sitting in those design labs with those folks, actively working on, on real projects and things that are happening. We have kids uh, with physical therapists. We have kids placed with an orthopedic surgeon, for instance, and he has the opportunity to actually participate and watch surgery. Um, we have kids who've been involved in uh, the political campaigns of some of our local politicians as they run for uh, election in these midterms. Um, so real life opportunities for our kids to understand what it is that they, they want to do. Uh, and I want to give you an example of a student who um, had decided that she really wanted to be an elementary teacher. And so we placed her in an elementary school um, in the fall semester last year. And um, within three months or so, she was back saying, you've got to take me out. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I liked doing it, but I don't want to do this. And it's terrible. Um, and so we ended up replacing her, that sounds bad, replacing her in, in, in the nonprofit zone. Um, and she's connected with Foster Village here in town and absolutely loves the work that she's doing. Is connected to what she's doing and is going to be hopefully extremely successful in that one day. But what did that do for that student? If she hadn't figured out that she didn't like elementary education, she would have gone away to college, she would have got a degree, and she would have got into student teaching. And at that moment in time, she would have discovered, I really don't like elementary education. But by then, it's now very tricky to, to change course um, and, and it creates a dilemma for a lot of people. And so that's part of our job is to make sure that we try to direct that early, as early on as possible. Um, and we do that through some of these programs. And we're fortunate that the community is willing to work with us and to really give these kids real experiences. They're not just the T-boy. Um, they truly are operating in these spaces um, in real life. So not only our kids are, are winning awards at the state level, but our faculty are too. So Judy Pryor was a principal finalist in the HEE Excellence in Education Awards last year, um, and got to attend that fabulous banquet as well. Um, Andrea McCarthy, you saw that our girls were 5A state champions in the SWIM uh, UIL, and she was named the 5A 6A Coach of the Year um, for both of those divisions. And then Jenny Lindsay is our Latin teacher here at the high school, um, and she was named to a Lifetime Achievement Award for the Association of the Humanities something. Um, and uh, really for the work that she's done uh, in producing the publication that that organization puts out, that has had a huge influence in the growth of their membership and in the sustainability of their programs over time. Um, and if you speak to any of our kids who've been through um, Ginny's Latin series, Latin 1 through Latin 4, you, you, you can see her connecting kids to passion about language that um, is unexpected and very welcome for our kids. All right, Tiffany Duncan is going to walk you through our life changes. Good morning. So you can see the numbers on the screen and the breakdown of our staff. I do want to point out one of the numbers, which is that collective whole, the 931 permanent staff members we have. Uh, but I, instead of spending time on numbers, I want to talk for just a few minutes about the people who are behind the numbers. Every slide that you've seen today, uh, all of the student achievements that you've seen today, there is a staff member or multiple staff members supporting teaching, facilitating, encouraging, and guiding our students to do these wonderful things that they're accomplishing. And so I was very excited to be able to come and speak with you this morning just to give a plug of applause for the life changers that we have in place and the life changers that we continue to build the capacity uh, to do these wonderful things out here. And so while you can see a snapshot, one of the pieces that might not be represented on this slide are the almost 200 substitute teachers um, and a, a quite a large number of temporary employees that we have come on board and off board for various things we have going on throughout the year. And so when you pump that number from the 930s to well over a thousand staff members, you have a, a huge organization of folks who care about love and wish to serve kids in all different capacities. And so one of the things that's very exciting about being part of the work here and part of the Human Resources Office is to see 
it doesn't matter the position, it doesn't matter the title, we all believe in education, we all believe in what we're doing, and everyone has an important role to play. And with that comes that personalized professional learning concept that we hope to continue to build upon. This year for the first time ever, the Learning and Innovation Department has headed up a leadership academy that's just for our staff. And it was open through a rigorous application process to all staff. And so that's just one concrete example of some of the things that we're doing out here for the employees who work so hard and are so dedicated and spend just as many hours as our students in all of these wonderful things that we're doing, engaging from the learning day to the planning to all of the extracurriculars that support and enrich our educational programs. So this is a snapshot drilling down to our, our teaching staff and faculty. The starting teacher's salary, that's a zero-year teacher without any teaching experience, comes on board at $46,500 for their base pay. Now, of course, um, we are experience-based <coughs> in terms of that step scale, so that's our starting space um, for a teacher without experience. And then, um, you can see some of the statistics of our averages and the turnover rate. I do want to point out that the staff turnover rate, um, one of the things that we watch for and that we try to gauge against is, of course, the, the state turnover average rate, and uh, then more importantly, and even more importantly to us, that regional turnover rate. We want to make sure that we're maintaining a percentage, as we are right now, below those state and regional turnover percentage rates. Um, but of course, we always want to whittle down on that, and we want to work with, with retaining our great life changing staff. Part of, part of that is the culture that Dr. Gearing was speaking about in the video that we saw earlier. If you're happy where you are and what you're doing and you're able to have freedom and autonomy in your classroom to teach and facilitate and make a difference and be a life changer, that makes a huge impact on teacher retention. In addition, there's always a financial component to consider. And so what I want to point out, along with this slide, that's not reflected on this slide, um, and actually just say a large thank you to our board members and to our administrative team, Dr. Gearing and Elaine Cogburn specifically, um, is a big thank you for the, we, we conducted a, a salary survey and study last year to make sure that we were uh, competitive marketably you know with that with all positions so we didn't stop at okay what's the competitive market rate in this regional area for teaching staff or for instructional aides that are in the classroom but for all staff so our staff enjoyed a three percent general increase and specifically for our teachers that base salary and a starting teacher pay you see was shifted to make sure that we're meet that we are marketable but we also added upwards of 400 well over at this point four hundred thousand dollars of additional teacher stipends and those range anywhere from the additional supplemental duties that are being created on almost an annual basis because our students are doing more and more as they take control and personalize their learning experience here at the SISD um, but also, uh, just to move back into the teachers with advanced degrees, 24.7% of our teaching staff have advanced degrees, which typically means a master's degree. Um, for quite some time, we have uh, had a stipend for any teaching faculty with a master's degree, uh, and we this year layered an additional subject area master's stipend. So if a teacher has really honed their craft in their specific subject area and recommitted several years and a, a large financial commitment as well as their time to becoming an, an expert in that field through a formal educational path, we now are um, incentiv incentivizing that and um, for our existing staff recognizing that additional dedication to the classroom and to their subject area and their craft or trade. Um, so again, it was, kind of as Dr. Gearing mentioned at the beginning of the slide, I could sit here and talk to you all day long about some of those great things that we're able to do to recognize staff and uh, the amazing things that our life changers do. But I think if you connect the life changers and the teaching staff and all of the auxiliary staff that make things go to all of the achievements you've seen today with the students, that that really does paint a great picture to show the dedication and professionalism we have out here. I'm very glad to be a part of that process. So, uh, that said, and substitute teachers having been mentioned earlier, I know that, recognize that I was last in and I'm going to be first out, but please forgive me, I am actually going to conduct a substitute orientation training this morning and I'm kind of double booked. 
With that, I'm going to hand this over to the next one. So just as the district excels with student performance, um, financially, we are very high performing as well. And as I said last night during this presentation, the state of the district is good, if not excellent, when it comes to the finances. We have received five stars on the Texas Smart Schools rating system. This is a system that was created several years ago by the state comptroller. Another group has taken it over, but it, it, it does measure performance by students against cost of achieving that performance. And there are only, I believe, 49 districts in the state out of slightly over 1,000 that have achieved five stars. So that's a huge accomplishment. In addition, Every year since its inception, we have received a superior rating on the first report. This is a report uh, designed by the Texas Education Agency that measures a variety of indicators to gauge not only is the district financially stable, but are they solvent and what are the trends looking like to ensure that solvency. And that, that rating has been around for, I believe, 16 years, so that's quite an accomplishment. And then as we um, sold bonds this past summer, we went through the rating process and Standard and Poor's um, gave us a rating of AA, which is the second highest rating you can get. The highest is a AAA. And the Moody's a AA2, which is the third highest rating by Moody's. And these are very um, highly respected entities that are totally independent of the district just to reaffirm the district's financial standing. We look at our tax rate in 2013, in the 2013-14 school year, our tax rate was $1.49. After that year, um, 45 cents, in 2013, the district began planning for a bond that was passed in May of 2014. With that planning, we anticipated that the tax rate on the debt service side, 45 cents, would need to go to 50 cents to support those bonds. We were able to keep that tax rate with an increase of only three cents at $1.48. And so after the May 2014 bond election, the tax rate went to $1.52. In early 2016, we started seeing the signs that we we're going back into recapture. And we'll talk about recapture again um, in a minute. But in anticipation of that, the only way to be able to afford opening additional schools and serving additional students with the dollar four was to do a tax swap through the passage of a tax ratification election. So in September of 2016, the voters overwhelmingly approved that swap. We moved 13 cents from the debt service rate, or laser works, and we moved the 13 to m and and lowered the INS, we were able to maintain that total rate of the dollar 52. And then in May of this year, um, we held another bond election for $132 million. After a series of controversy, that did um, get confirmed, and we sold $110,000 of those bonds. And we were very fortunate to be able to keep these same tax rates and not have to increase the debt rate to service this additional $132 million worth of bonds to build additional facilities. So our current tax rate remains at $1.52, as it has since 2014. So when we look at budget, we have two ways of splitting out our costs. One way is by the function, which is this slide. And this basically breaks it down to where are the costs being allocated and how are the funds spent. And what's important to notice here is 60% of our budget is allocated to the classroom. So instruction is everything that happens in the classroom, the supplies, the teachers, um, anything instructional in nature. But then when you look at instructional support and direct student support services, and these are things like the counselors and nurses and in the principal's office and the Department of Learning and Innovation, that bumps up the total spent on direct student support and instruction is at 69%. So what this graph shows is that the majority of our funds do go towards instruction. The next biggest plot is maintenance and operations. 
and that's to keep our facilities running. So we do have seven campuses and several support facilities to run the operations of the district. And the biggest cost in this arena is utilities. So those are costs to keep the climate and the atmosphere conducive to learning. So keeping the lights on, um, keeping heat and air running and water. So when you take all of those costs out, there's very little that's spent in other arenas. The other way we break down the budget is by category or object. So we know the areas, but then within those areas, how are the costs broken out? And so because we are a labor intensive industry, 84% of our budget is payroll. Well, if 84 is payroll, that's pretty much a fixed cost, right? We're a growing district, so we're going to be adding staff over the years. So that leaves very little funds at our discretionary spending. And in contracted services, the more majority of that is utilities. So utilities are under maintenance and operations as a function, but then they're categorized as contract services. So that really leaves us about 7% to really work with when we're looking at if we were needing to do budget cuts. And that's in the area of supplies and materials and then other things like professional development, travel, advertising, miscellaneous. So the majority, the overwhelming majority of our budget does go to payroll. I mentioned recapture a minute ago. This is not a new phenomenon for Dripping Springs. Um, since at least 2006-2007, the district has been categorized as a Chapter 41 district. For those of you that aren't school finance experts, um, which I'm assuming is the majority of you, this is a measurement by the state on your wealth or per your weighted average daily attendance. So if your wealth per water exceeds a certain level, you are deemed wealthy and you, congratulations, get to send money back to the state. And so this was happening um, in sporadic ways in the past, and then we got a reprieve. There were three years where we did not have to pay recapture. We were a gap district. And then as I mentioned earlier, in 2016, property values really shot up, and that's what put us back into recapture. And now as property values continue to grow, those projections continue to escalate. So when we return to recapture, we sent $2.9 million of tax collections back to the state. Last fiscal year, we sent $5.2 million. This year, we have $8.9 million budgeted. And then that the projections grow to $12 million and then nearly $15 million by 2021. So unless we see a change in the law at the state level, this phenomenon will continue, so that makes it very tricky to balance our budget because we don't get to keep all of the revenues that are generated from the property taxes, and that's by design at the state level. So that's a picture of our, a quick picture of our overall finances, and I'll turn it back to Dr. Gary to talk about the work. Thank you, Elaine. It's really important as a community that we pay attention to what's happening at the legislative level because of the school finance picture that we find ourselves in. So in 2006, when the state compressed the tax rate for school districts and tried to fix school finance that way, um, they promised us something called the franchise tax to fill the gap. So they lowered tax rates for everybody in the district um, and they promised that the state would step in with this additional funding to close that gap and make sure that funding didn't change. Well, that didn't quite work out the way that they thought it would, and so that's part of the reason that school finance is in the shape that it's in over time. And I would like for you to pay very close attention to Governor Abbott's new school finance plan that he just put out, um, because if you read it on the surface, it looks really promising. He says a lot of the right things up front um, about what we should do. The main premise of what he's putting forward is a cap on appraisal value growth in school districts at 2.5%. So considering that we grew in appraisal values by almost 12% last year, um, that suddenly changes the financial picture for a district like Dripping Springs. Um, what you don't see anywhere in the plan is where the $3 billion that the state is now going to be short comes from. And so we find ourselves, I think, back in a very similar situation to where we were in 2006, is that we will take care of taxpayers and make sure that 
that we fix one part of the problem, but we're not addressing how we're going to make sure that school districts have enough funds to still operate the way that they were. Um, and it truly takes away local control from school districts, um, which is one of the big premises that we have, um, that local communities should be making decisions about how they run their local communities. So I would like for you to pay close attention to what happens um, in that. We do have a legislative session coming up. Uh, one of the best ways that you can support the community is to be an advocate for public education and for doing the right things for kids as we go forward. We passed a bond in May of 2014 and we're just wrapping up all of those bond projects now. That was Sycamore Springs Elementary and Middle School um, and various other projects that we completed over time. Uh, and we did pass another bond now in May of 2018 and we're in the planning process of putting all of that construction together. So I'd like to just tell you very quickly what those major projects are and give you a quick update about where we are in that process. So this building was designed um, as a high school in 2010 when we swapped the middle school and the high school. It was master planned for 2,500 students. In other words, they built enough cafeteria space, gym space, and those major um, spaces to make sure that we could house 2,500 students. Uh, but we currently have a capacity here for about 1,850 kids in classrooms. Uh, we right now have almost 2,000 students uh, in this building. And you heard them coming in for the start of school a few minutes ago. Uh, and that's going to continue to grow over time. So we're expanding classroom facilities here to 2,500 students. Um, and that should get us through the next couple of years. Uh, that work is in the design phase right now. So we're in a schematic design on this project right now. Um, and you'll start to see construction on this project starting in the summer of 2019 uh, with an open date of August of 2020. Uh, we are scheduled to build elementary school number five uh, for the district. That should go somewhere north of 290 uh, between uh, here and uh, Sawyer Ranch Road. We're still finalizing the actual site um, and that's in negotiation right now. Uh, hopefully that will get finalized over the next couple of months. Um, and that will be an 850 student elementary school, which will be master plan to accept the middle school with it on that site um, when that becomes necessary a little bit later in the development of the district. Uh, we are expanding the transportation center at its current site. Uh, last year we bought 17 new buses, this year five more new buses to expand our fleet to manage the growing student population. So we have to have parking space for those buses. We have to make sure that we can maintain them adequately on site and fuel them. Um, and so we're expanding the current site to its maximum capacity. We're squeezing every square foot of, out of that site on the west of town. Um, and that will get us through the next couple of years and then we'll have to be looking uh, at adding a second transportation hub somewhere in the district. We are going to be building a brand new <coughs> Springs Elementary School at Dripping Springs Middle School. Um, and that will eventually create a, a site very much like Sycamore Springs elementary and middle school where we have elementary and middle schools together um, and then that will hopefully be finished in August of 2021. We'll move Walnut Springs Elementary as a whole school to that new site. Once that is complete um, then we'll renovate the current existing Walnut Springs Elementary School and move the administration, central administration back from where we are right now into Walnut Springs um, and that creates opportunity for the partnership we have with the city of Dripping Springs Dripping Springs Community Library and Hayes County with the Town Centre project that's operating through the City of Dripping Springs tours at the site where the current administration building stands. We're doing some athletic improvements across the district. Really this is mostly just turf replacement and track replacement in the district for Dripping Springs Middle School Tiger Stadium, Old Tiger Stadium, uh, the existing track field at the high school uh, and the competition field that's at the new stadium. When they built the stadium around uh, that field, we did not address the turf at that time because it still had existing life on it, and so we wanted to make sure we used up all that life. But in the next year or so, um, those fields are all going to be coming to end of life um, and need to be replaced for the safety of our student athletes. We have technology infrastructure improvements going on throughout the district. This is not end user devices. This is infrastructure, so servers, uh, network, and those kinds of issues to make sure that we stay up with uh, the amount that, that our kids and our faculty are, are using technology in the district. And then we're making sure that we have enough land in the district to plan for future development. Uh, this includes elementary number five site that we're working on right now, uh, as well as um, future development sites for the district. 
And the reason that we're doing all that is because of this. So in 2006 7 we had 3,700 students in the district. We're right now just right at 7,000. And uh, the monitor tells us that over the next 8 to 10 years we will double in size. So we'll be almost 12,000 students um, by 2025. Uh, we, when the demographer does these five and ten year look forwards, they uh, produce three levels of growth for the district every time, a low growth model, a moderate growth model, and a high growth model. They expect that you'll end up in that moderate growth model probably more than likely. Um, we've exceeded their high growth model year over year for the last three years in a row. And so that's why they're coming back in the spring to do a full demographic study from the ground up again to make sure that, they, that we have adequate projections for the next five and 10 years out so that we understand what we're planning to set these for as we go forward. The good thing about population and survey analysts is they're also working for Lake Travis ISD and doing a full demographic study for them in the spring as well. So we'll do those two in conjunction that gives us a much better regional picture of what's happening with the growth and development of housing in, in the two districts and then also the student population uh, demands that we'll, we'll have to plan facilities. Important thing to remember here that for us, the big question we're going to have to answer is in 2025, in August, we'll have about 3,300 students at this building, at this high school level. And we have a capacity now that we're expanding to of 2,500. So 120% of 2,500 is 3,000 kids. And so in 2025, we're going to have to have a solution for the high school on the ground, whether that's a full expansion of this current facility or a second high school, something has to be ready to, to go by then. In order to make that happen, we have started long range facilities planning up again. Um, this is a little unusual the way that we're doing it this time because uh, usually we only do this in preparation for an actual bond that we're about to call in within a year or so. Um, we're not about to call a bond within a year or so, but there are some very deep conversations that we have to have as a community because of this high school issue about what kind of a district are we going to be? One of the questions that we'll be asking the demographer in the spring when they do their study is what does our ultimate build out look like? So what do they think we're going to eventually end up with as a, as a school district? And specifically at the high school level, how many kids do they think they will have? Because that will determine are we going to be a 10 high school town or are we going to be a three high school town? I think those are very important questions for us to consider as we start to wrestle with this concept of are we going to be a one high school town with a big mega high school or several different versions of that one high school, a ninth grade center or a 10, 11, a 9, 10 and a 11, 12 like Plano or are we just going to have a college style campus with 6,500 kids on it? Those are the kinds of questions we're going to have to address and have to ask ourselves. Or are we going to keep our high school smaller and split out and start to develop uh, different sites across the district um, to deal with the high school population? Those are difficult questions and I really feel like we have to have deep community conversations about them so that we truly understand what the wants and needs of the community are before we start planning for that infrastructure. Give you some idea, a high school facility, whether it's an expansion of this current facility or a new facility, will take two years to construct, it takes a year to plan, and then you have to have a year to, to find the funds to get that done. So that's four years. So 2025 sounds like a long way away, but when you back up that way, suddenly we're in 2021 calling a bond, and we're already in 2019 just about, um, and so that's not a long time away at all. And so we continue to do this planning. We actually had our first meeting of long range facilities planning last Thursday night in this room. Um, had about 60 or 70 people in here talking about what are we going to do and how are we going to do it. Um, if you're interested in that conversation, all of those meetings are public board meetings and anybody can attend and observe. If you want to be actively working on that committee, just let us know. Um, all of the materials from that meeting are posted on the website. We have a special webpage just for long range facilities planning. Um, and there's also a Google form there that you can fill out if you want to join the committee. Um, and also a Google form if you just have some thoughts or suggestions or questions specifically related to facilities planning in the district over the long term. As we plan facilities and as we're designing facilities, we're always asking ourselves the question, what do we want learning to look like for our kids in order to prepare them for their future? And that's what drives what we do and how we do it in the district. All right. Thanks to Torchy's Tacos for providing the tacos for us this morning.
Um, I'm happy to try to answer any easy questions that you have. If you have hard questions, I have people for that. Yes. You talk a lot about, I appreciate the value of a college degree. What are we doing to, what's the district's responsibility for carpenters, electricians, plumbers, all those things that you find hard to find? I, th I think that's a really great question, Peter. Um, you know, I don't think that college for all is the right answer to the question. We have way too many kids coming out of college with college degrees who are in fast food jobs and who are sitting at home on mom's couch because they can't find an adequate job. I think it's m way more important for us to connect kids to what they're truly interested in and passionate about because then they will truly learn, number one, but also they'll come out with sets of skills that are uh, effective for their future. Um, and that's going to become more and more important in time. So we spend a lot of time working with our kids on trying to connect them to what are you really interested and passionate about. Um, I believe that you don't find your passion. You don't just suddenly wake up one day and say, oh yeah, I really want to work with wood and be a carpenter and build houses. Um, I think you develop your passion over time. And you develop it by experiences um, that you have that tell you what you like and what you don't like to do. And so that's what we're trying to to do um, throughout our kids' K-12 experience, pre-K-12 experience, is give them those experiences that help drive and narrow them down towards what it is that they really want to do. And then we're going to support that no matter what. I think a great example is we just developed a real estate course at the high school, for instance, that's in our business program. Um, and we're actually preparing kids that by the time they graduate, they can sit their real estate license and they can exit out of here as a licensed realtor. And we actually have kids who've done that, and we have several who have already sold their first houses as, as first year out of high school kids. Um, and they're on the path to being, being very successful, probably way more successful than I necessarily am. Um, and that's necessary and, and absolutely connected to what the needs are in our community. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that we feel are, are pretty important. Um, now, are we doing, can we do that in, in exception to preparing kids academically? Absolutely not. We have to make sure that they have the tools necessary to be successful, no matter what. The more and more, they're gonna to have to have some kind of post-secondary training or education, but in my opinion, that doesn't have to be a college degree at all. Yes? Would you mind explaining a little bit about the lawsuit that came up during the bond election and how that's affected the district? I will try to do that as succinctly as possible. So, as you know, the May 5th election was very close, about 35 vote difference, um, which was a little closer than I would have liked. Um, so, it was successful initially. They filed for a recount of that, which is a legal process. So we stepped through that legal process of doing the recount. The recount didn't change the vote very much. It, it changed a few votes. We ended up with a 38 vote margin. Um, we then had a group who filed a lawsuit against the district called a bond contest, elect, uh, bond contest lawsuit, um, and that put us in litigation. Now, as you know, litigation can draw out over a very long period of time. So the government code has a, a provision that allows public entities like ourselves to turn around and file what's called a bond validation lawsuit, which is a very expedited process in order to mitigate that drawing out of, of a bond election contest. The reason for that is we've got $132 million worth of dollars on the line, which time changes a lot of things about interest rates, about escalating construction costs, um, and planned projects that we promised voters that we would take care of with that part of money. Um, and so we were, then very, we were then successful with that bond validation lawsuit, and the bonds were validated um, uh, in a very short amount of time in terms of legal action uh, within two months. Um, and so we were able in September to sell $110 million worth of those bonds and now we're stepping into projects. So we have been successful in that process. We believe that the voters told us what their will was, even though that was by a very narrow margin. We have to accept what the community tells us and, and that's how we do that. And now we're going to proceed and do what we said we would do in the first place. Uh, legal costs for the district were just a little north of a half a million dollars. Um, and. We, you know, in terms of escalation costs and bond interest rate costs, we calculate that impact could be in the $2.2 million range for the district. Um, fortunately, 
it may not turn out that way just because we're close enough within the window that we're trying to get all of those projects back on track. Um, we, we have only a two month delay and so we're really trying to make sure that we close all of those windows again and get them back to where they were, which will hopefully over the length of the bonds altogether mitigate some of that cost. But it's really hard to say exactly where that final number will work. Is there a way to prevent the district from having to pay out at that expense in the future in terms of a bond? Um, so I, so I can't control what other people do, I can only control what we do. So right. part, that's part of the reason we're entering into long range facilities planning early. Um, we really need to make sure that we have the full trust and support of our community as a whole as we go through this very difficult process of planning for such rapid growth in the district over time. Um, you know, we are growing rapidly, that's a fact. We are public schools, so we have to accept all the kids who live in our district who want to come to school here. And it is our pledge as a community that we'll provide a personal and exceptional education to every child who steps in our doors. And so that costs money, it's just bottom line. Uh, we're going to be as good stewards of taxpayer dollars as we can be, um, but we're also going to plan effectively for the future to make sure that our future generation has what they need to be successful. Um, and again, I'll say that does cost money and it has to get paid for some way. The mechanism that is in place at the state level for that right now is local property taxes. Um, we're in a fast appraisal rate growth area. Um, you know, I, I live in this area, so I feel it just like everybody else. But my kids are in the school system and get an outstanding education um, in the school system as well. Uh, and so uh, I'm prepared to, to pay that premium because my kids are getting that education. Um, Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, it's noted that we have 150 acres at Sawyer Ranch and 24 acres at Mount Gainer. Yes. Can you explain what we can do with that? Like, I don't know how many acres this is, how much, like, is that going to be enough for three schools? Is it 24 only in elementary or middle school or a combination like Sycamore? Yes, thank you very much. That's a great question. Um, the 100 and, we actually have 155 acres at the T of Sawyer Ranch and Garden Hill. Um, we bought that additional five acres so that we control the intersection um, at Sawyer Ranch and Darden Hill. Uh, that is enough space for actually three schools. And so in the plan, tentatively right now, is an elementary, a middle, and a high school complex at that site, um, which will essentially produce an education village um, over the long term for the district. Uh, part of what we're working really hard on in terms of the learning in the district is being able to have kids flow effectively over grade level lines because we want to meet them where they are and take them where they need to be as opposed to saying if you're 10 years old you have to be a fifth grader. Um, so creating proximity of schools allows us to make that transition more effectively. To give you an example of that right now at Sycamore Springs Middle School we have over 170 kids who are bused every single day from Sycamore all the way to the high school. Um, with that distance of 10 miles or so, there's about a 25 minute transition time for those kids and that's 25 minutes of instructional time that we're losing in the day. If you have that proximity that allows you to, to do that a little more seamlessly and efficiently. Um, the site at East Mount Gainer and Ranch Road 12 South is 24 acres. It's planned right now to be elementary school number 7 and it will be a standalone elementary school like Dripping Springs Elementary is. Um, eventually in the district, if the plan works out the way that we've talked about, we'll have four elementary middle school sites like Sycamore, so we'll have Sycamore, we'll have the new Walnut Dripping Springs Middle School site, and then we'll have two new complexes, elementary number five and middle school number three, and elementary number six and middle school number four will be together, and paired with each one of those pairs will be a standalone elementary school. So you can't build a middle school every time you build an elementary school. Um, but paired with those will be at one elementary school, just like Rooster is paired with Sycamore right now, um, and they're kind of a, a feeder pattern. So we'll have Dripping Springs Elementary paired with Walnut Springs and Dripping Springs Middle School, um, and then elementary number seven will pair with, with elementary five and middle school three, and elementary number eight eventually we think will go somewhere north of Dripping Springs Elementary School on Ranch Road 12 because we have Anarene coming in um, north of town, which will be about 1,600 homes at some point in time. Um, so we'll, we're predicting we'll have elementary number eight 
that won't come on board probably until after 2027. So that's a little further out than, than we're looking right now. Um, but part of the land acquisition that we have in this bond is to make sure that we're adequately planned for, for those sites. Um, that's the tentative plan, so I'm not telling you that that's exactly what's going to happen because it really does depend on long-range facilities planning and on decisions that are made with timing. I think uh, our high school decision is going to have an impact potentially on what that looks like and how that does eventually. Um, so initially when that 150 acres was bought in the district that was bought before I got here um, more than seven years ago, um, that site was designated for high school number two on the east side of the district. All right, thank you very much for coming this morning. I think there's tacos, so grab one on your way out for the road. Um, I hope you have a great Thursday.